legalizefreedom.com. Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Listen without limits. Unchain your brain. Change your thinking. Change your life. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Claire Ray Randall who joins us to discuss her book, The War on Gender, Postmodernism and Trans Identity. Transgender rights have recently come to the fore as a social issue and yet there are many who feel that this is being pushed too far and too fast. Claire Ray Randall is a transsexual woman who transitioned in the 1980s and is deeply concerned about this precipitous rate of change. Can it have a happy ending? The War on Gender examines the progress of trans from a personal perspective, which has seen it come from being a marginal issue to one that is now having a disproportionate influence on social values, including material on the neurodevelopment of gender, medical, legal and ethical issues, metaphysical analysis and critique of the postmodernist deconstruction of gender, this book challenges the viral transformation that transgender ideology has already wrought upon Western society. Hello and welcome, Claire, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Well, thank you very much, Greg, for inviting me. Today we're going to be talking about your book, uh, The War on Gender, Postmodernism and Trans Identity. Before we get started, tell listeners a little bit about your background and work. Now, a lot of, of course, the, the background to this is your your own transition in life so we mm-hmm. don't we don't have to cover all that at the start but it's more just to give people an impression of you know of the of your career the work that you've done um well i um my, i took my uh, first degree in uh, philosophy and psychology at leeds university in the mid 70s um i was first um i first encountered um groups of trans people in leeds in 1974 uh, it was pretty recherche at the time. Um, I did attempt a social transition at the time, but it was far beyond my means to manage as a young person, less than 20 even at the time. So I then I went on and I got into a kind of journey of self-discovery, which uh, culminated in um, uh, taking an art therapy diploma um, so that uh, I qualified as an art therapist, which involved an immense amount of uh, personal self-analysis. Um, and uh, eventually I realized that uh, this um, problem, these feelings that I'd had about my gender identity, which I'd had since the earliest uh, childhood, uh, were not going to be um, available to uh, treatment by psychoanalysis or anything like that at all. So I... Um, uh, decided to go back and um, complete this transition. Um, Since then, I've uh, worked in nursing. That's been one of my um, main um, career avenues. I've also uh, taught um, psychology for a short time at a local further education college in A-level. And um, interestingly, from a later point of view, um, the two subjects that I was um, giving specialist uh, tuition on were um, visual perception and... uh, linguistics which come into quite a lot of my work the way i understand things um and then uh, in the 90s i was also involved with a uh, kind of new age group which um led to me writing a book about it called waking the monkey which i self-published um some years ago um <clears throat> in more recent times i've been involved with a local uh, community arts group here in headingley called uh, leeds combined arts and we do um, all sorts of things, poetry evenings. Um, I've taught some art classes there this year, and in just today I uh, led a heritage walk around uh, some parts of Old Headingley that I believe you may yourself be familiar with, Greg. So I've had quite an interesting life, and um, I think I might just be on the verge of a entire new chapter of uh, interesting 
Oh, I think we can safely say that. Um, it's certainly <laughs> if, if, the, if the content and response thus far to your book is anything to go by and, and the waters that you're, uh, uh, the deeper waters that you're entering, shall we say. T- to kick off, I suppose, I mean, something that I've always wondered about this, you know, from, I mean, I would have been, I suppose, a teenager when I became aware of, um, obviously I was aware that there's such a thing as, as gay people, but when I, mm-hmm. I the, the, the whole, transitioning you know wanting to actually you know change your identity at that level i became vaguely aware of i didn't know anybody that had done it as you say it was very it was rare back then or at least not you know much more difficult than it is now Mm -hmm. um but so one thing that was always at the back of my mind around these issues was trying to imagine which you can't you can't really do what it must be like you know speaking as someone you know a, a man who is never imagined dreamt would never want to be anything else is completely comfortable in, mm-hmm. his, in his own skin um mm-hmm. a heterosexual man i'll just throw in for what it's worth um no mm-hmm. I, I, I think that can be a spectrum if you see what i mean i'm not convinced yes. that anybody oh, yeah. that anybody is 100 percent anything um well yeah but, but nevertheless you know with that feeling of of contentment not you know i don't mean resting on laurels you know there's always self-improvement and and work on yourself to Mm do inner and outer but as someone who's very comfortable in his own skin and would never wish to be anything else and against and also caucasian you know man living in western you know advanced countries that's a whole sort of problem category now in itself (laughs) (laughs) but um but speaking as that how do you, I mean, even if it's just a, a drinks party over some chit chat and someone finds out about your background and says, you know, can you begin to, in, you know, in a, in a few sentences, uh, begin to try and get across to someone like myself what those feelings were like? Now, you artic- articulate it all very well in the book, but just for the benefit of our listeners, you know, can, it, it, is language just too feeble a tool, really, to to try and um, articulate the, you know, the feelings that you had, the, you know, the, the, the yearning that, and, and also the, the ins- revulsion at some level as uh, to, to what you were born into. Um, well, I mean, I think you've done quite a good job of, um, summing up, summing it up yourself there. I mean, it, it, it's completely and utterly beyond r- rationality or reason. It's, there's no, there's no, um, justification in, in, thinking this because of certain things or anything is simply that at my very earliest age i mean i had a few momentary images of you know vague recollections before this but kind of the first moment i was aware of myself what when i realized that the boys and girls were physically different it was like kind of coming into consciousness it was like suddenly being aware of of this and of myself and who and what i was and just feeling completely that it was wrong and that, you know, it, I should be otherwise like what I had realized girls were like. Um, and one, one of the things I've been reflecting upon this, obviously, since I've had the book published recently, obviously, I've been thinking a lot about the questions that people might ask me. And one of the things I was just thinking about this morning was how even though I felt terribly ashamed about this, terribly embarrassed, I knew that uh, it would be completely, just utterly beyond the pale for anybody um, for me to explain it to them or even try and describe it. Um, but yet there were still moments during my childhood where it became just really, really strongly obvious to me and things that happened. Um, I, I, I think I... I kind of list little details of things that happen that stand out in my memory. And um, however much I I tried to put this away, um, it it always came back. So one of the things that people say is they, well, how did you know? How can you possibly say you feel like a girl? I I have no idea. I cannot say. I cannot make that claim. All I can say is that there was this profound sense that I should be. And it, it was rooted in the sense of my body. So that when I came to transition, I had to kind of re, I just like relearn who I was in a way, um, from the point of view of coming at it from existing in a body that was becoming new and different from, um, you know, what I'd had before. And then as I became, um, perceived generally, 
as I as I wanted to, um, I found that I was able to fit into that somehow with great more um, ease, really, than what what um, had been before. So th there was like a social element to it, but it's not the kind of the way that um, gender ideologues and feminists talk about it in terms of conditioning. Um, it's more it was more a matter of self discovery. Well, we have this sort of binary gender, how can I put it, framework of of our species. And again, this is re replete throughout nature. But you could turn that question that you mentioned that someone might ask, you know, how could you possibly know? You could kind of turn that around in a way. Um, and, you know, you could ask me, for example, or the same person, you know, the, the drinks party guest could ask me, well, how can you know that, that you, you want to be a man, that you want to remain a man? How, how can you know that? And I can't explain that either. Uh, so it's very much like that. Um, well, I, I, I mean, that's, that's a kind of reply that I'd never really considered, but yes, yes. So I understand it. And that, on that level, I understand it. <clears throat> it's something ineffable. It's like, well, it's beyond questioning really. It's, I don't know why. It's because what I am. So, it, this, that actually, that thought has led me to perhaps a little inkling more of understanding <clears throat> of how you must have felt. Uh, you you were looking at your, what you what you wear and and looking at at kind of the, the the alternative as it were and looking at that and saying that's what I am, you know. And how and how do mm. I how do I get there? You know what what what's happening? What has happened? What is happening with me? You know, you're you're looking at something else and you're seeing yourself in that way, whereas. Uh, for me, um, I, I just look at the mirror and I see myself, you know, and I know that that's, you know, that, that all is good, that I don't need to, to be somewhere else or to be someone else. And so I, I, on that level, I can understand the, po the powerful feelings because, you know, if someone said to me, okay, you're going to under, undergo forced transitionary surgery, you're going to be reassigned. Oh, you're going to be reassigned. I would be absolutely horrified. I don't want to be a woman. Oh, yeah. I don't want to be a woman. No, 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 no. I don't want to be a woman. That doesn't mean that I've got any problem with women. But so I think I'm beginning to grapple here with just the feelings mm. of like, you know, being comfortable with how you are, but having, or having this profound discomfort and a need to be, to be something else and to understand. I think we can say on one level that the feelings that you had and the feelings that I may be articulating about myself are the, are the same. It's just this, we know, we need to, express what is within us and uh, i think that's really what you've done and as you said it wasn't going to be enough to do that on some kind of psychological level oh undoubtedly undoubtedly there was absolutely no question about it right from the earliest memories um and obviously this comes into the whole kind of uh, i mean maybe i'm getting ahead of myself here but this does come into the whole kind of um definition of um, the kind of modern transgender um, concept, um, and particularly since um, I I grew up with the word transsexual, and that's what I always understood myself. That was the word that, when I was about nine or ten or so, I came across. That was the word, and I, it perfectly uh, explained, you know, who and what I was. Um, and uh, obviously, as I go into in the book. The whole kind of concept has kind of morphed, particularly in about the last 25 years or so. But uh, I'll, I'll let you probe into that gently because it's quite a, you know, the whole, the whole linguistic deconstruction of this whole business is, is pretty extensive. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's a, a general topic I touch upon in many different interviews on mm. many, many topics mm. is how language being manipulated, changed and the meaning of mm. words, you know, uh, morphing or being, let's say, deliberately changed into something other than they are to the point mm. where sometimes things apparently now mean the opposite of what they used to mean, which is, you know, yes. <laughs> which is just crazy. Yes. But I mean, one of the headline issues here is, this idea of, of gender being an artificial construct, you know, kind of in, in the milieu that we're, we're wading through these days, uh, some kind of artifact of socialization. You, you touched upon this a few minutes ago. And mm -hmm. for me, that, that's just completely, you know, postmodern madness. It's, it's kind of like, what are you yeah. talking about? Yeah. And, and to me, it seems just so self evidently, um, nonsensical. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, as I go into um, perhaps a bit later on in the book, I mean, basically, you know, gender is a quality associated with the different sexes. Um, and um, 
you know, there is, obviously there are minor di distant, um, differences of nuance between different cultures. Um, but I think that um, once you get past the, the minor local differences, uh, you can, you know, see that the underlying um, natures of the two sexes are, you know, the, the, the same the world over and merely adapted through uh, necessary circumstances and history of culture to um, have those, you know, kind of nuanced social differences um, that, you know, we, we see today. And but yet... Um, I, I see all the time, you know, postmodern gender ideology people, um, you know, su suggesting that um, the, you know, minor socially nuanced distant differences that happen between, um, you know, women in India and uh, women in, you know, Western countries is is f a fundamental thing. It's a fundamental thing. It's it's not got anything to do with. Uh, um, you know, the local cultural circumstances and history, it's entirely arbitrary. And of course, obviously I'm with you on that. Obviously these things are not arbitrary. They have arisen out of um, evolutionary biological roots of who we are. You know. This other um, slightly ridiculous thing uh, of identifying as something that we have at the moment. Now, I'm all for people just be who you are, do what you want. You know, if you're not hurting anyone else, just go for it. You know, so I'm as, uh, in that sense, you know, as, as, mm. li as liberal mm. as they come, it doesn't matter who finds it acceptable or otherwise, you know, uh, you're not dictating to other people. You're just doing your own thing uh, and you should be left alone to do so. That said, this identifying as thing, it seems to me that if, if people struggling with identity in some of the ways that you described, then identifying as something is hardly a satisfactory solution, really. But it seems to be so important, uh, apparently, to so many people. I mean, it's like, well, if you have this a crisis of identity, if you want to use such a big word, uh, you know, what, 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 do you, what do you want to do next? You know, you, you want presumably to... Uh, resolve it if you can, you know, because there's something about your existence that's not satisfactory. So what, what, what should we do? I mean, is it psychological? Are you going to be able to, you, you know, sort this out in your own mind? Or do you need, a, do you need a, a, a physical transition? You, do you need to literally become somebody else in that sense? Uh, a combination of the two? What's it going to be? But the, the identifying as it's now been turned into it's gone to ludicrous lengths where literally mm, I, mean, I can, yeah. I can now say to you, I, ident I identify as a black single mother, um, lesbian single mother. Um, yes. you know, yeah. um, I know I'm Jewish by the way, just to throw it into the mix. Oh, of course. Uh, and, yeah. and, and whatever else. And, uh, there'll be some people who'd be saying, right. Yeah, fine. Because that's what you are then. So you will then be treated as such. It, it's bizarre. It's utterly bizarre. I mean, I think we talked about this previously, you know, in, in some precursory chat. Um, it, it's one thing to feel some kind of, um, like, like I think I may have said, for instance, one may say, oh, I, I identified desperately with the plight of the Palestinians and the way they're treated. Well, to say that, you, you're recognizing the feelings that you might be able to understand that they have or, or you have feelings about that that you feel bad about or whatever. And, um, uh, but it's not saying that you think in any way that you are a Palestinian. You're just saying that, well, you know, they have problems. I feel for them. And, and that's, that's perfectly all right. Um, um, on the other hand, I mean, I might say I identify as English because I am English, you know, and, and so, but then when you start saying I identify as, as something, you're not identifying with something or you're not identifying as something that you are already demonstrably um so then you're getting into kind of speculative territory really i think well i think using the word identify i identify as is, is basically a you know it's overt omission that you're not that thing because you know yes. otherwise yep. you wouldn't be saying you identify as it so if i identify as, as a black uh, lesbian single mother then i'm basically saying i'm none of those things well, exactly that. It's it's a kind of linguistic that it's a it's a linguistic kind of sleight of hand where you say, you know, um, uh, I you know I can identify myself as a member of the local community or something like that, which is just a simple statement of fact. You're like pointing to yourself and saying that person is a member of the local community. But then to it's like I say, it's a, it's a linguistic sleight of hand to say then I identify as something which you are demonstrably not. It's completely, it's um, 
it's one of these, you know, how they, they like to change the meanings of things so that they're still using words that they think everybody understands, but then they turn them around, they've turned around the meaning so that people are kind of hoodwinked into seeing these things in a way that is completely, you know, not rooted in the actual real use of language and they're they're hijacking it and, and turning it into something completely speculative and nonsense, really. Yeah, an identity as a word, as, a, as, a, as a, an issue, a concept is like so important. You know, people maybe spend their whole lives looking for one or questioning um, who mm. they are. And that, so that ad- identity and identify you know, linguistically these things closely linked, it then becomes mm. sort of like, oh, if you don't allow me to identify as something, you're somehow denying me an identity. If yeah. I say to you that if I if we hadn't met before and I'd uh, in an email I'd say to you I identify as a man, I'd imagine the pr- first thing you would have thought was, "All oh, right, okay, so this is not a man." Yeah, well, yeah, yes, yeah. I mean, that's a very good way of putting it. I would think, "Oh, well, this is presumably some kind of trans person who may have some kind of indeterminate gender status, and they want to state that." I, I mean, this reminds me of um, uh, a, a chat thread I've had on. Um, a, a trans women's group that I'm a member of uh, online, and um, they're 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 much more in my kind of um, you know kind of part of the world as ideas go, and they were all saying that uh, when it comes to things like Jeremy Corbyn having um, his website saying his pronouns are he and him, um, they're all saying look we we don't want to have to draw attention to pronouns all the time we don't want to have to have attention drawn to the fact that we might possibly have some kind of you know gender anomaly we we just want to if we possibly can fit in as um you know as as smoothly as possible into uh, the existing categories and hopefully uh, if p- people perceive us as such they will use the you know appropriate pronouns that we prefer but if you're actually saying to people i want you to use these pronouns then it's kind of it's kind of um counterproductive because obviously you know like you say either you're not what you're saying you are or else you're giving away some kind of trans status which is the last thing anybody wants to do unless well if they really are you know transsexual as i you know um call myself you know um but obviously, there are now people in the transgender world who are uh, who are perfectly happy to display it all the time. I mean, it's it's it was a big decision for me to to write this book and put myself out there and disclose myself. And I'm quite happy with my life in Headingley and involvement and things. And uh, trans hardly comes into it at all, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so here we are. In uh, forgive me, this diversion. You're probably wondering where is he going with this, but no. it, will, it will all become clear. No, go on. In uh, oh yeah, the the British comedy series Blackadder. Baron von Richthofen, the German flying ace, says to Blackadder, um, How lucky you are, t- you English are, to find the toilet so amusing. Uh, for <laughs> us, it is a mundane and functional item. For you, the basis of an entire culture. So where I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> where I'm going with this is the section in your book that made me laugh, and there's very serious issues around uh, this, but uh, oh, it's, yeah. it's what uh, I call... I know where you go. Yeah, what I call toilet tensions. And this whole issue, which is on one hand laughable, um, unintentional comedy is invoked, but on the other hand, of course, very serious, part of some very serious issues here. But it, that's almost become emblematic. This whole, again, it's almost like an English farce, isn't it, around the use of toilets and, and trans issues. Mm. Mm. Um, mm, has become mm. absolutely emblematic of some of these issues. You know, it really underscores the ludicrous kind of position that we find ourselves in. And again, just to, to make a point here that will come up again and again, we're talking about the number of people affected by these issues is m- minuscule. And that's not, mm, not to mm. say that it isn't very significant for some of said people, but it's just to put it, uh, you know, in a, a perspective here. We're not talking about 99 Point five or ninety nine point seven of the percent of the population being directly affected. We're talking about point five or point three of the population. Yeah. So, just reading through your section on use of toilets again, it was a mixture of like sort of horror on my part and and, and sort of again unintentional mm. comedy. Mm. Mm. Oh well, I, I I don't know what I can add to that really. I mean, you know, uh, it, it it it's. 
I, I mean, obviously, one finds oneself thinking about uh, um, the, the status of transition that people have got to. And really, I just want um, something that's going to be the accepted by the by the largest um, the largest amount of the population. I want to for people to be able to reach a consensus um, about this. And obviously, um, there are going to be you know kind of grey areas here. Um, I mean, for instance, butch lesbians sometimes get challenged in women's toilets, and obviously they don't wish to have to prove their you know bodily status. Um, but then on the other hand, of course, we go too far in the other direction where people who are not just women who are a little bit butch, but people who are obviously, you know, transgender in some description, but are not making any effort to, you know, comply with social expectations, um, expect, uh, you know, this kind of entitlement where you're not making any effort, but, um, you know, you demand that you should be treated in a particular way and obviously we're, we're kind of seeing that now and as you say it's it's a minuscule amount of the population in fact these these people who are making a big fuss about this are um you know and access to, to to toilets when they're kind of inappropriate and you know demanding rights and so on and so forth that's only um you know if 0.3 or 0.4 percent of the population have you know gender anomalies then the number of people who are doing this are even smaller because there's only a small proportion of anybody, you know, who who has uh, gender identity issues or, you know, trans identities or whatever. So all this talk about, um, you know, uh, gender neutral toilets, um, I'm, gl I'm glad there seems to be kind of pushback uh, against that. Um, but at the same time, when the, since the pushback has come, which I just think like a, a, a just a kind of attempt to return to normality... Of course, there's a lot of kind of um, there's a there's a kind of overshoot baggage that's that's come with this, whereby um, I'm seeing quite a lot of hostility to the whole concept of um, trans people, and you know I think one of the most important things that you know I, I kind of mentioned already I think um, about this is that we need to be able to distinguish between different subgroups of of, of trans people, those who have you know you know, gone all the way, such as myself, and who, who really wish to, um, you know, settle into society and not make any kind of political issues. And then, and as I as I found out, really within the first year of, of, of involvement with this, back in the mid-70s, I discovered that there were people who were like me, and there were people who wanted to make it a kind of political issue about deconstructing gender as far back as 1975. It's incredible. The quote, there's a quote in your book about the, the general prevalence of trans issues, uh, you know, in the media and in, you know, sort of political circles. And it's just, it's, it's, it makes a lot of headlines. And, uh, you, you point out that, uh, all of this has come, quote, from nowhere to become entirely dominant. Now, that's one of the trigger warnings, that expression from nowhere for me in terms of agendas. Uh, whether, yeah. they, whether they be social, mm. p political, mm. or, or otherwise, mm. maybe even economic, environmental, you name it. Uh, if it's come from nowhere and is suddenly everywhere, then it's like, that's a red flag for me in terms of like, okay, wh wh why is that? Well, I think it's been primed for a very long time. Um, as I say, even back in 1975, I came across people who were kind of agitating within the world of... Uh, TVTS groups, as they were known at the time, transvestites and transsexuals. The transvestites, they were quite happy to be called transvestites. They didn't want to claim female identity or anything like that. They, but they, they saw that there was a kind of overlap. But it, it kind of got out of the bubble in the 90s. Um, and then in the early 2000s, there was... Um, I, didn't, I didn't understand this at the time, but the 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 2004 um british um gender recognition um bill act as it became and david lammy a name you may recognize david lammy mp he uh, proudly boasted that it was the first um gender recognition act in the world to break from requirements for um 
medical treatments such as particularly surgery for male to female transsexuals which um i think there was something like 26 countries previously had already get you know passed gender recognition acts and they all required that male to female transsexuals have gender reassignment surgeries because just in the general mind it's it, the idea of a woman with a penis is kind of a bit you know <laughs> we may be hearing about it recently but up until the 2004 act um this was not the case legally um so since then now i was in i was in a, a particular group um uh on online at the time um for uh you know trans women myself transsexual women such as myself who had completed full medical reassignment and um they all agreed um that with the passing of this act with the removal of the requirement to have completed medical treatment we would see a kind of breakdown of the boundary between these and we would see people who had not had full medical reassignment claiming gender recognition um certificates and um i include um in the um in the appendices i include a uh, significant section of the uh, house of commons debate in this in which um it's stated that the kind of thing we're seeing now would not happen this was only 17 years ago 16 18 17 years ago something like that so um um obviously a lot of people are aware that david lammy is a bit of a far left agitator and i'm sure he was not alone in fact i found that professor stephen whittle um someone who i'm familiar with or who i was familiar with in the 20th century had actually um been working on this and then he published a paper about a year or so after the uh, recognition act went through in which he argued for um the fact that post hoc he he explained how the gender recognition act of 2004 had not merely set the boundaries for recognition for when somebody might have um moved from one legal boundary uh, one legal category to the other but um but uh, but but explained how it was that the actual meaning of gender and sex not just gender sex that the meaning of sex had been legally changed by the 2004 act that concludes part one of our interview part two will be available soon in the subscribers area at legalizefreedom.com legalizefreedom.com <laughs>